Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. And once again today, it is Wednesday evening and we are in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, gathered here together, him and me, for the um, 83rd edition of Exploding the Israel Deception, where we took a little decourse into what did the reformers think of the papacy? What did the reformers think of um, the Roman Catholic Church. What did they think of the beast number one and beast number two mentioned in Revelation chapter 13? Things that are quite interesting to go back into and to see um, what does historicism actually mean when you build your knowledge on future prophecies. I call them future prophecies because prophecies are just saying something that will happen in the future and you measure that on history that happened and um, the reformers had a lot of possibility to do that we today even have more possibilities because we live four or five hundred years after most of these people and we went through a few of the quote-unquote reformers or the voices of famous men um, and their standpoint on the mentioned subjects before the reformation uh, we are now enduring the Reformation and then we will even go after the Reformation. And um, after the Reformation, yeah, maybe a few hundred years ago, you still had a lot of people who had a, not only a meaning on that, but also wrote books about that and taught about that. But today you have most and for all false teachers. The world is full of false teachers. And that's why we are so reminded by uh, by the word of God that says don't let any man deceive you any man also that is the man behind the pulpit the man that you give authority by sitting in the pews and listening to him and gobbling up every BS that he tells you without measuring it to the Bible the word of God that's where the biggest problem comes from and let me assure you Tom and I we have learned the hard way that you should not be deceived by any man but really should do your own studies. We are for the moment in a very intensive study on different subjects and we see how even we have gotten, have been betrayed, not have gotten, have been betrayed. And um, this is a good moment to turn it over to Tom so that he can give you your standpoint and that he can give you the standpoint on what real historicism is. Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, welcome to the broadcast, brother. Yes, very well, and uh, good to be with you and the listeners. And uh, to reiterate what you're saying, I, I'm going to use stronger language because it's appropriate to use stronger language to describe what has happened in the churches since about the early 1800s. Frankly, we've been lied to. We've been intentionally misled. And what we're learning from this study, all of these all of these studies that we've done is to prove that only in our generation are we ignorant of history. We don't know who the Antichrist is today. We don't know who the synagogue of Satan is. They never teach us any of this stuff. When all the generations prior to ours knew precisely all these things. They knew the papacy was the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. All are terms in the Bible used to describe none other than the papacy. Okay? The papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Don't look anywhere else for the Antichrist because you will not find him. There's only one character in history that fits all the prophecies of the Bible, and that is the papacy. The, it, the, the mystery is solved. There's, there's no more questions to ask. There's no reason to doubt this. And the proof, as we've been giving the listeners throughout all of these discussions, the belief of all true Christians prior to about 1800 A.D., was that the papacy, the pope, whether he is the current reigning pope or some ancient pope or someone, some pope in the future, they all fill the office of Antichrist. Every pope from the very beginning pope to the very last pope 
will be the Antichrist of his day. Okay? The title of Antichrist doesn't shift from one institution or someplace else. It belongs to the office of the papacy. And this is what all Bible-believing Christians, as we have proven over and over, by direct record, that's what they have always believed. Bible-believing Christians throughout the century have always believed and taught that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. The mystery is solved. Don't look anywhere else for an Antichrist. If you, if you believe what they teach in the churches today, you are an enigma. You are unique in all of the church age. If you believe that the Antichrist is not in the world today, but that he's some future single individual to come, you are unique in all church history. I want you to understand that. You don't agree with any Christians that existed prior to about 1800. You don't agree with any of them. If any Christian prior to about 1800 or 1805 AD, any Christian all the way back to the first century church were to hear what you believe, what your pastor has taught you about the Antichrist, they would shake their heads in shame. How could you possibly believe that malarkey? And now you know why we're proven to you from written record what the saints of history have believed about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist. It is, was, and always will be the popes of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, and one listener finally told me, he said, you are the one who taught me who the Antichrist is. And that was music to my ears. But now let's talk about what the, are the consequences. If you comprehend now and accept the historical belief of true Bible-believing Christians, that the papacy is, was, and all, every pope in succession from the very first pope to the very last pope that sees Christ's literal return. He is the Antichrist. If you believe that, as I believe and as Yerk believes and as every other true Bible-believing Christian all throughout the church age, if you believe that, then you've got a dilemma, a very serious issue that you must deal with. Why do you still sit in a church that teaches that the Antichrist is not in the world? Why do you still participate in a Christian organization that calls itself Christian but is not Christian at all, who says the Pope is not the Antichrist? It's some geopolitical, religio-political leader that is yet to be seen in the world that will deceive the whole world, that will persecute the saints, and on and on and on, when the papacy has always done these things. What are you going to do? Are you going to still continue to, to finance and to, to show yourself participant in these wayward churches? There's no other way to describe them as, than as apostate churches. How could your pastor leave you ignorant as to who the, the Antichrist is? Let me tell you something. If you don't understand, the Protestant Reformation took place because a vast number of Roman Catholics, having read the Bible for themselves for the very first time in their lives, about 1500 A.D., the printing press came out, the Bibles were being were tra being translated into every language. People were beginning for the first time in their lives to read the scriptures for themselves. And they all came to the unanimous conclusion. Well, this is describing the papacy. It can't be anybody else. Our Pope, our Holy Father in Rome is the Antichrist, the very man of sin, the son of perdition. And so they came out of the Roman Catholic Church like scalded dogs. They were worshiping in the synagogue of Satan. They were worshiping and obeying the man of sin, the counterfeit Christ in the world, the popes of Rome. And they educated the whole world. 
who the Antichrist was. And of course, they couldn't educate the Christians throughout the centuries who have always known that the papacy was the Antichrist. These were Roman Catholics that came out. The Protestant Reformation was led by Roman Catholics who finally came to the realization that their most holy father in the Vatican is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. And they came out and joined the saints of Almighty God throughout all the generations in the single belief that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. What has happened since then? Well, they began to teach in about 1800 that the papacy is not the Antichrist. The papacy is future because here's the kicker. Listen very carefully because the 70th week of Daniel has not yet been fulfilled, and it's going to be fulfilled not by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, but by the Antichrist sometime yet in the future. That's what you've been taught all your life in the churches. That's what's been taught in the churches in this country all the way back to 1800 A.D., and only since 1800 A.D. has this abomination ever been taught in God's house. And we've all believed it, hook, line, and sinker. I'm just as guilty as every one of you. I have nothing on any of you. I've been drugged through the futurist uh, sewer all my adult Christian life. There's no future Antichrist unless you're talking about a future pope. There's no historical Antichrist unless you're talking about a historical pope. There's no current Antichrist in the world unless you're talking about the current pope. It's the pope. All right? How many ways do we have to tell it? It is a fact. It is the ancient belief of Bible-believing Christians all throughout the Christian era. We're the only generation that's ignorant. It's time for us no longer to be ignorant. Now, what's driving all this? It's the teaching of futurism that has essentially said that the Protestant Reformation was a grievous mistake, that the papacy is not the Antichrist. It's someone yet in the future, which says that the 70th week of Daniel must be fulfilled in the future, which is a denial that Jesus the Christ fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Do you see what they've done? Now, our leaders, our Protestant, our Protestant pastors, our Protestant teachers are telling us the protest is over. We're not protesting the papacy anymore. We made them a, gravest, a grievous mistake 500 years ago. Martin Luther was wrong. Zwingli was wrong. Calvin was wrong. All the Protestant reformers were wrong. They mistook the papacy for the Antichrist. When now we understand the papacy is future because the 70th week of Daniel is future, right? So the Protestant Reformation was an error, was wrong. Now what's to be the next order of business if we believe, erroneously as it is, if we believe that the, that the Antichrist is yet future, what, what do we have to do now? We have to unite all of Christianity with that belief, right? Because the Protestant Reformation has created the greatest division in the history of the so-called Christian religion. I mean, the great, the great, uh, the the great elephant in the room in Christianity has been the split between the Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church. The belief that the Protestants had that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist is wrong after all, they say. So we have to do whatever we can. We have to work day and night. We have to prove by scripture, history, and prophecy that the papacy is not, never was, never will be the Antichrist. The Antichrist is future, and therefore we must unite all of Christianity, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, even with the Muslims, if we can, the Jews, if we can, unite us all to fight this future Antichrist. And, I mean, and, and you all know, if you read your Bible, Jesus prayed that we all be united. 
just as one as Christ is with the Father, he prayed that we would be one with him and the Father, that there be no division amongst us. That's what Jesus prayed for. It's unity that Jesus wants. There's no doubt about that. No question about that. We don't want to bring that into question. But we want the truth. And the truth is, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That's a done deal. That will never change. Okay? That's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And here's something else. The 70th week of Daniel was the seven-year ministry that existed between Jesus' baptism until the stoning of Stephen and the going forth of the, of the gospel out of Jerusalem and the Jews into the Gentile world where it is today. The 70th week of Daniel and everything about it has been perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago, and no one can argue with that. The, the proof that you need is the New Testament. It is the perfect, infallible, historical record of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70th week being fulfilled by Messiah the Prince. The last and final week of that 70-week prophecy was Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. And nobody can argue with that. I defy anybody in this listening audience. I defy every doctor of divinity. I defy every professor of theology anywhere in the world to bring any credible argument that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future and has never been fulfilled in the past. And when he does, I will show you proof that he is a Christ denier, that he denies the blood that bought him, that he has rejected the Christ that bought him 2,000 years ago, that he is yet in his sins, and when Christ returns, will be will reap his vengeance. Now, is that a challenge that anybody wants to take me up on? You doctors of divinity, you educated fools, I'll take you on one-on-one -on -one in any debate, in any forum, anywhere in this world, at any time. And I will mop the floor with you. And that's the best that should happen to you. You thieves and liars, robbers of the saints of Almighty God. You plunged the entire Christian world into delirium. And you're going to pay. You're going to pay. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. Thus saith the Lord, the vengeance is mine. I will repay, he said. And you better believe, unless they repent of their damnable futurism and start telling the historicist truth, they will reap the wrath of Almighty God when he returns. And I don't want you to be among those who reap the wrath of Almighty God for believing this ridiculous futurist lie. It's so easily dis disproved that a child could do it. Well, I count myself just a little bit more than a child, but trust me, I am capable of whipping him like a dog if he wants to take me on in this debate. And I don't care who he is, what his name is, even John MacArthur, bring him on. I'll roast him on a spit. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, I've heard many of your introductions into our readings, but um, this one, I think, um, was very powerful and to the point. And wrapping it all up. But before we wrap this uh, broadcast up, we will go back into this little video and we will speak about the next reformers during the Reformation, um, who, uh, what kind of use they had. The last that we saw that was Nikolaus von Amstorf in the last broadcast, and now we are going to see Johann Funk, or Funk, the, who you see here beneath. Johann Funk lived in 1558, and he declared the Antichrist to be the papacy. He declared the little horn, the man of sin, Revelation 13, first and second beast, the harlot of Revelation 17, and the uh, and mystery Babylon of Revelation 17, all to be the papacy. Now, let's make sure not all points of Johann Funk 
are correct. Not all points of all the reformers are correct. But in one point, and this is when you look through this list, in one point they all agree. The Antichrist is the papacy. And between the first and the second beast, maybe here and there is a little misunderstanding. But that's okay. That is the same in this world that we live in today. There are many, many teachings out what the first beast and what the second beast is. And one of the points where we're going to the study is to show you that there are many reformers before the Reformation, during the Reformation and after the Reformational time who see the first beast as pagan Rome and the second beast as papal Rome. Now, Johann Funk doesn't belong to that, um, to that kind of uh, reformers. He equates the first and the second beast both to the papacy, but that's probably because he thinks the first and the second beast are both Rome. And that's true. Both are Rome. And who was Johann Funk, or Funk, as you probably would call him in English? Funk was born in Wörth, now part of Nuremberg. And Nuremberg is maybe a city that you know. And if you don't know it, I'm going to show you something that is very interesting when you go to the town hall of Nuremberg. And we're going to look at a few pictures. And you will see something that will interest you very much. Well, let's see, can we get this a little bit bigger? Let's see if we go right to the website here. Now, this is big enough, okay? You see this? This is the town hall of the German city Nuremberg, who most of the people probably know because of the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War. And this is the town hall. This is the entrance of the town hall that was built by reformers. And what do you see? You actually see pictures of the beasts as they were predicted by Daniel. You see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome above. Here. I think that is very interesting to know that Johann Funk, a reformer who we just speak about, came from a part of Nuremberg and then you look at the Nuremberg City Hall or Town Hall and you see these pictures. You can even see them today. And um, I have to give credit to um, a man who I saw make a video on this years and years ago. Uh, by the name of Walter Veit, who put me to that, and he said there are uh, city guides even doing tours today, even today in 2022, and um, telling the people all about the town hall and all about the city of Nuremberg, but when asked the questions, what do these figures mean, they all have not the understanding. They have no idea what these figures are talking about. And I think it was uh, some six, seven, eight years ago that I saw that video of Walter Feit in the time I watched movies, uh, videos of him. And in one of them, he showed these pictures of the town hall and uh, even an interview of the, uh, of the city guides. So Johann Funk came from there and he obtained an MA, that's a Master's of Art, at the University of Wittenberg. That's where Luther lived. Yeah? He was a contemporary of Luther because he lived between 1518 and 1566. He was a Lutheran theologian. Um, what, all, what else is interesting to read of him? I don't know. You can always read these because I will uh, put the links to all these reformers that we speak about in the description box of the video and you can look it, for them, look it up for themselves. But it is quite interesting that it says here the Prussian estates, feeling that their rights were infringed, appealed to the Caesarian, uh, to the Caesarian of the country, King Sigismund II of Poland, who sent a commission in August 1566 to Königsberg to investigate the matter. Funk, together with all his councillors, Matthias Horst, Hans Schell and Johann Steinbach, was charged with opposition to the ecclesiastical and political governance of the state. 
ecclesiastical and political governance. So that means church and state in once. They were to charge, um, to, to do an investigation of how the state there is run, is ecclesiastically, means spiritually, and politically, means um, in our world. The Polish Commission directed that the case be tried by the court in Kneiphof, in Königsberg, and they were all condemned and executed in the marketplace before the, the, the town hall in 1566. Steinbach had to leave the duchy and um, Skellige escaped. So these people kept themselves busy with the separation of church and state because that is we are speaking about the time of the Reformation, 1566. The Reformation was what? Some 40 years old, 45, 50 years old. And um, of course had its repercussions in the daily life. And it had its daily life in that matter also that church and state needed to be separated. And he, together with his comrades, was charged with opposition to the ecclesiastical and political governments to make these points and to, you know, um, I think understand in that way that he had to see it to, to, to separate those two. Yeah? So that there will not be a church and state conglomerate as we have today, um, sadly enough to say, all over the world. That's about Johann Funk. Then we have the next one. Uh, his name is Virgil Solis. Virgil Solis also identified the Antichrist, the Little Horn, Revelation chapter 13, the first beast, not the second, Revelation chapter 17, the harlot, and Mystery Babylon, all as the papacy. Now, who was Virgil Solis? Now, we have to take a little look into him. He lived between 1514 and 1562. He was a member of a prolific family of artists, was a German draughtsman and printmaker in engraving, etching and woodcut who worked in his native city of Nuremberg. So he comes from the same city that um, <coughs> uh, Johann Funk came from. Oops, what, what's that? Oh, uh, what happened here now? My computer, all of a sudden, everything went black. Um, Tom, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Did you see that? Everything went black? Yeah, I'm not sure what that was. I mean, I, I saw it. It's, it's still, it still records, so we can probably go on. But uh, yeah, the recording is still running, it says so, in Skype too. Yeah, it's also running. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, that threw me off the horse a little bit. <laughs> um, so why do I have only here this Virgil Solis page? And uh, let me just check here, there's something, something is wrong here. So, that's better. Uh, we have had this page. The computer must have had a problem here. So, this and this. So, Virgil Solis, he lived between 1514 and 1562. His prints were sold separately, <coughs> meaning, the etching, uh, meaning the etchings and engravings, or formed the illustration of books, normally woodcuts. Many prints signed by him are probably by assistants. Um, it's interesting to know that he was a kind of artist who put these things in woodcuts, as, as you can see here, um, because uh, Martin Luther also had this um, one artist, I just uh, forget his name for the moment, who did a lot of the en en engravings and um, illustrations to Martin Luther's books, like um, the papacy and institution of the devil, for example. Um, I will come to his name probably a little, a little bit later. Um, he published an armorial of the Holy Roman Empire in 1555. Uh, what is an um, armorial? That is a um, uh, Wappenbüchlein. Yeah, that's uh, a, a little um, book that 
can be used as a weapon probably to show what the papacy was all about. I cannot go into that. But anyway, um, we see in the movie here, uh, in the movie, oh, where is that now? Uh, it's not, oh, I'm sorry, we have a problem here because the video is not showing. So I have to go back to the video, start it again. I don't know, that never happened before. Beast by Reformers, here it is. And here we were at Virgil Solace. You know, th this can happen when you go live with things like this. All of a sudden you have the technique uh, leaving you in the cold rain. Huh? Okay, Virgil Solis, enough on him. Then the next one we speak about is George Negrinus. He uh, identified the Pope as the Antichrist, but also thought maybe the Turk was the Antichrist. Uh, you have to understand in that time, the Turk, the, uh, the Islamic army, uh, stood before the walls of uh, Vienna even. They were really conquering all of quote-unquote Christianity. So I think it is understandably that George Negrinus maybe was taken a little bit wrong there by understanding that the Turk is the Antichrist, but also he understood that the Pope is the Antichrist. With that, he was right. The man of sin, of course, is the papacy. Revelation uh, chapter 13, the first beast, is pagan Rome. And Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, is papal Rome. Now, this is a very important point to understand. Because, as you will see in future studies that Tom will probably do with me, I hope at, and pray at least that that will be so, when we got a little bit deeper into the matter in biblical verses and that we are really settled in the understanding of it, we will show to you that the first piece of Revelation 13 is pagan Rome and then the quote-unquote fall of Rome, the morphing, the morphing, let's say, the morphing into the papal, the Holy Roman Empire, as it's called today, is the second beast. And that is the healing of the wound. No 1929, no 1866 um, wound or 1798 wound or whatever. We will show you a completely different understanding. And even George Negrinus, who lived in the 16th century, understood that the first beast is pagan and the second beast is papal Rome. Now, what do we know about him, George Negrinus? I have no, um, I have found no Wikipedia info on him, so that's why I opened this page because I was looking for him. And here is a record ID on Negrinus George. You can see that's the guy we are talking about. He lived between 1530 and 1602. He was born in Battenberg and the Eder, and he died in Exel. He was an evangelical, controversial theologian. He was a schoolmaster in Buchau and in the Latin school in Munich. He was a pastor in Bürgeln and Kölbe, in Homberg, Ohm and Gießen, and he was a superintendent of the High Hessian Diocese Alsfeld Nidder in Exel Wetterau. Um, he worked between 1555 and 1598. Um, and then it does just give a little bit information on him. But there's, as I said, there is no information on uh, Wikipedia on him, which is easier to see. And this is here in, uh, even in uh, Dutch. You can see in the Dutch language that gives us some uh, information about his children. And um, then we can see here. Uh, no, this is just uh, some sources where they got that thing from. Uh, anyway, there is not so much to tell about Negrinus George. I'm sorry, not every one of these people. There is much information left till today, still today. But I think um, that this Revelation chapter 13, the first beast being pagan Rome, and Revelation chapter 13, the second beast being paper Rome, is an interesting point, and I just want to see if Tom has to say something uh, to that at this moment already. Well, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit frank. I mean, I think you kind of danced around the issue. The issue is, 
that we've been believing and teaching, you and I both, for a long time, that the 1798 figure is uh, uh, proof of that fulfillment. Yeah, or 1866, Tom, because... Um, or 1866. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me just spit it out so the, <laughs> so the listeners don't have to guess. This is where the Seventh-day Adventist Church is wrong, okay? Everybody, you know, a lot of people accuse you and me of being Seventh-day Adventists, and we've been telling them over and over and over, no, we're not Seventh-day Adventists. You know, we've got some serious issues with the Seventh-day Adventists and what they believe. And uh, this is it. Uh, they don't know who the first and second beast are. The first beast was pagan Rome. That beast that was in power when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. Remember, Daniel predicted in his prophecy four Gentile world kingdoms prior to Christ's return. The first was, Me was Babylon which fell to the Medes and the Persians, which fell to the Grecians, and finally the fourth and final beast of the earth would be Roman. And the first beast was the pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars, that restrainer that had to be taken out of the way so that the man of sin could be revealed, that is papal Rome. It, the second beast is papal Rome that replaced the first beast. Paul talked about this. Paul talked about the one who had to be restra was restraining the rise of the man of sin was the was the Caesars in Rome, and that's why he couldn't spit it out directly for fear that his letters would fall into Roman hands and he'd be persecuted if not killed, which eventually was. But the Thessalonians and all the Christians in, in Jerusalem in the first century would have been persecuted by the Romans for believing that the Roman Empire was about to crumble. The Caesars were about to be taken out of the way. The government of Rome was going to be replaced by another Roman government, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that had to be revealed before Christ returned. Okay? And there you have it. Don't look for a future fulfillment of this. That's the futurist lie that all these lying dogs behind the pulpits of our churches want us to believe so that we'll reunite with the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy and unite all of quote-unquote Christianity under our single spiritual head, the man of sin in Rome. They're leading you down the primrose path to perdition. The first beast, as believed by all serious Bible-believing Christians, that's, that's why Yerk is going through this monotonous, laborious list of people and trying to show you Wikipedia articles about them to prove that what they believed. They believed that the first beast was the pagan Roman Empire and the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 was the papal Roman Empire, and all of this took place 2,000 years ago after the death of Christ and before his return. Prophecy fulfilled. And what that means is the Seventh-day Adventists are wrong. They always tell that the first beast is papal Rome and the second beast is the United States of America. Now, I'm not sticking up for the United States of America. It's a diabolical government. It's a papal government. It's just the strong arm of the papacy ex exercising Roman authority all over the world. That's why the United States have become a global police force. It's the battle axe for the pope. But the beast is the pope. The man of sin is the pope. The Antichrist is the pope. The United States is just the Pope's handmaiden. Okay, that doesn't make it a Christian nation. That makes it a papal nation. That makes it an anti-Christ nation. There are Christians in this world, in this nation, but we are going to be persecuted like no time in history. The United States of America is going to persecute the saints of the Most High just like Rome has always done. 
and they're in the process of enslaving us right now. The government of the United States is all about this ecumenical movement to unite all Protestants, all Jews, all Muslims into one, uh, one eclectic religious stew and make a global religion out of it with the papacy as its head. The United States government is a functionary of that rebellion that is seated in Rome. The United States of America is the handmaid of the papacy. And that's why you see the United States do the things that it does. That's why the United States government doesn't give a wit who you vote for. It's just an exercise to deceive you into thinking you've got anything to say about this government. The government of the United States is run by the Vatican. And we prove that by, by many various proofs. Anybody that's a constant and regular listener to Inquisition Update and Tom Fresh knows full well who runs the United States government. And it is not the people. It is the popes of Rome and the Vatican. And uh, we've got even uh, a papal nuncio, a papal uh, uh, ambassadors to the to the Holy See have confessed this in book form. I read that book verbatim on the air, and it's an admission that the papacy controls both foreign and domestic policy for the United States. You know what that means? All of our foreign policies are controlled by the Vatican, and all of our interior policies are controlled by the Vatican. You know what the interior policies are? The civil laws of this land, federal, state, and local, the Vatican controls the laws of this country to make you conform to Roman Catholic canon law. You don't write law. Only the papacy can write law. The papal nuncios, the, the college of bishops, the, the, uh, the uh, synod of bishops, they are the ones who promulgate law. The Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress, they're just the handmaids of the bishops. They put in legal language what the papacy has approved for passage as legal as legal policy for this country. And the United, United States Congress just puts it into legal form. That's all they do. They're just a secretary for the Pope. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Congress doesn't give a whit what you want. They answer to the Pope. They answer to the College of Bishops. And they are the ones who promulgate law. And that is to make you obey Roman Catholic canon law. Now, what about all your futurist pastors that have told you that God's holy, eternal, and immutable law is just for the Jews? Are you getting the picture? They've been lying about that, too. You disobey God's law like the papacy wants you to. So you will obey the Pope's laws. That's why your pastors in your churches, your abominable, damnable, apostate pastors in every church in this country is teaching you that God's law is dead. So you gladly obey another man's law, Roman Catholic canon law. And that's the business of Congress. That's the business of the College of Bishops. That's the business of the Papal Nuncio. That's the, bis the business of the, the, the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, and the patriarchs of the Roman Catholic Church. The second beast is the Roman Catholic Church under the headship of the papacy. And he is the one who rules over the kings of the earth. Biblical proof of what I've just told you. He reigneth that city, the Vatican City, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You think that's just poetry? God is revealing to us who really rules the governments of this world. And it's your pastor's responsibility to tell you this. 
why is he not telling you this? Because he wants you to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. He wants to unite all of quote-unquote Christianity under one vicar of Christ on the earth. And they're lying through their teeth. They are lying, and they will reap the wrath of Almighty God when he returns. I'm here to tell you there isn't a church in this country that's worthy of your attendance. You find that shocking? Wait till Christ returns. You'll be shocked then because he's going to rewind the tape and show you how they have deceived you morning, noon, and night about the most critical aspects of our Christian belief. It's worse than I'm conveying to you. I just can't put it into words. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, you can put it into words in our future studies that I just announced because it is not only about who is the first and the second beast of Revelation 13, which is now quite clearly established that we are not talking about Rome and the United States of America, but pagan Rome and paper Rome. But we still have that question to deal with the teaching that is commonly taught in this world about the endurance of the reign, especially of the second beast. And that is so wrongly taught. And that needs a little bit more study from you and from me together with Robert. And when we are ready with that, we will put that out and then you will see that even if you thought, oh, I understand futurism now, you will see that you even scratch just the surface. Because what if the date of 1798 is not correct? What if the date of 1866 is not correct? Because the healing of the wound in 1929 has nothing to do with the wound afflicted in Revelation chapter 13. What if this 42 months have a completely different starting point to count from? That is not 538 AD as the Seventh-day Adventists teach. That is not 606 AD as Martin Luther taught in his book um, uh, of uh, the papacy and institution of the devil and so many other thought and taught, but that there's a completely different starting point. And that's what we are going to into a deep study in the future and making videos of that. And we'll show you that the deception the futurist deception just deals with this time frame given to us that now, today, in 2022, all lies in the past. And that is going to be a very, very interesting study. Any comment on that, Tom, or shall I continue in the movie? No, please continue. I hope, I hope we've made the point to the listeners. I mean, uh, look, we're reading this, this long, laborious list of believers, significant believers in history. The purpose of it isn't to bore you to death. The purpose of it isn't to demonstrate our minute understanding of the history. <clears throat> it's to prove to you what God's people have believed throughout history about the Antichrist, about the man of sin, about the beast, the first beast and the second beast. And we've proven it. Over and over and over again. They don't believe, they did not believe what we are taught to believe today. What we are taught to believe today is childish gibberish, ridiculous apostasy, heresy, damnable heresy is what we are taught by the churches today. And we are an extreme minority in the history of the Christian church. Only Christians from 1800 to the present have ever heard this futurist garbage that they teach in the churches. It's only about three generations. We are unique in all the Christian world. We are the dumbest of the dumb in the Christian world. We are the most deceived generation that has ever cropped up in the Christian belief system. And we got no one to blame but the papacy, 
the Jesuits and their Jesuit-controlled pastors behind the pulpits of our churches. And we simply must come to the truth, and we've got to do it quick, and we've got to take action. There's a lot at stake. Futurism is the most damnable lie I've ever, cons I've ever heard in my life. It has grievous consequences that I can't even articulate. But it has the whole world on the very precipice of worshiping a false messiah. That's what it's all about. And that false messiah is the papacy. I can't tell you how serious this issue is. It's worse than life and death. It's eternal life and death. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, and it really needs more study because even the deeper that we study it, we see that even there are some things that we haven't seen yet and we need to see them. And when we see them, we need to teach them because we don't want to be like the preachers and pastors and priests who all teach the mistake. We want to teach the truth. That's why this is called hour of the truth and why that's why this is called inquisition update to give you an update on the inquisition that is coming because you are deceived because we have believed a lie that's why the inquisition is coming because we believe the futurist lie there's a recompense that is about to befall god's people for believing in futurism believing a lie and I've said it before, I'll say it again. I know some people contend with me on this, but I believe it's the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And it has just as serious consequences. Back to you. Yeah, I think the consequences are more or less the same, Tom, because, because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, the heavenly gates are closed for mankind. And because of futurism, Everybody who believes in futurism, the gates of heaven are closed for him because he believes another gospel. What Jesus and the Apostle Paul, for example, always have warned from. Now let's go into David Kytraeus. I hope that I pronounce this man correctly. He lived in 1572 and he identified the Antichrist, the Little Horn and the Man of Sin all as the papacy. He understood that the first piece of Revelation chapter 13 is the Roman means pagan Roman Empire and Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, is the papacy. That was his point of view. So and what do we have to see on him on the internet? David Catraeus was born in 1530 and died in 1600. He was a German Lutheran theologian, reformer and historian. He was a disciple of Melanchthon, who we already spoke about. He was born in, Ingel born in Ingelfingen. His real surname was Kochave, which in classic Greek uh, was that is in, uh, not interesting about his name. Catraeus was professor at the University of Rostock, that's in uh, northern Germany. Um, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern today on the Baltic Sea, and one of the co-authors of the Formula of Concord. He is known for his work as the author of a Protestant Catechism. His original Latin text was published in 1554, then reprinted in 1599. Now it has been translated for the first time in German. It has been published together with editorial notes and commentary by Michael. He is the author of a treatise on music, De Musica. So much on David Kytraeus. We still have another reformer for you, which, whose name was Johann Ocolampadius, which sounds quite Greek, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But um, he was a German Protestant reformer in the Calvinist tradition from the electorate Palatinate. He was the leader of the Protestant faction in the Baden Disputation of 1526, and he was one of the founders of Protestant theology, engaging disputes with Erasmus, Zwingli, Luther, and Martin Bucer, and Calvin adopted his view on the Eucharist dispute against Luther. His German surname was Husken. That's not interesting. 
Uh, let's see, do we have something here in this career, which seems interesting on the first glance, when you glance about it, that he did. Um, he was able to refrain from some practices he believed to be superstitious, that's always good. Basil was slow to accept the Reformation, the news of the Peasants' War between 1524 and 1525, the inroads of the Anabaptists prevented progress. But by 1525, it seemed as if the authorities were resolved to listen to schemes for restoring the purity of worship and teaching. And that's what we all have to go back to, the purity of worship and teaching, right? Without any interference by man, but to go back to the biblical purity of worshiping and teaching. The scriptures alone. Yeah, exactly. Not sola scriptura, that's Latin, but the scriptures alone. In the midst of these hopes and difficulties, Ocolampadius married in the beginning of 1528. Uh, what about his theology? What is there to say? Well, I see here something about the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. So he is speaking about the Eucharist. What does it say here? His views on the Eucharist prompted Luther to publish several sermons on the subject in 1526. The sacrament of the body and blood of Christ against the fanatics. He did not minutely analyze the doctrine of predestination, as Luther, Calvin, Zwingli did, contenting himself with the summary, our salvation is of God, our perdition is of ourselves. Theologically, he was considered to be close to Zwingli, with whom he shared friendly attitude towards Mary and Marian veneration. Well, that's still Roman Catholicism within the Reformers, even Martin Luther had Mary veneration in his blood and to yeah, his death. Just let me tell you, Rome dies hard. Yeah. You can take a man out of the Roman Catholic Church, but it's nigh unto impossible to take the Roman Catholic Church out of the man. And you're going to find many of the Protestant reformers, a goodly percentage of them, continued to believe Roman Catholic doctrine even after they left the Roman Catholic Church, declaring it to be the synagogue of Satan and the papacy to be the Antichrist, and the whole of the church being the, the Roman Catholic Church being the scarlet uh, harlot on the Tiber. And they still, unbelievably, they still continue to believe that Mother, uh, that Mary was the mother of God for crying out loud. They said, the scriptures alone, we're going to let the scriptures and the scriptures alone be our pastor and teacher. But they clung to the diabolical teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, it, it's, it's very unfortunate. And that's why so many of the Protestant reformers are worthy of some criticism. But look, Reformation takes time. You, if you find yourself in a catastrophic accident do you heal overnight that's what roman catholics found themselves in when they discovered what the scriptures revealed to them about their church and about their doctrine and about their beliefs and about their popes it was catastrophic and uh it took many of them a lifetime to conform to the image of christ and put away all their Roman Catholic teaching, all their Roman Catholic doctrine. Listen, the transformation that has taken place in my life has taken over 20 years. I'm just trying to get the apostasy of Protestantism out of my life. Think what it would be like for a Roman Catholic. So I think this is why the Bible commends us to be patient patient you don't correct a man overnight especially when he has gone so far astray as roman catholics have been led and regrettably i'm learning to to understand how far astray i've been led as a protestant in this country and I beg the listeners' patience with me. Look, how long has it been? How long have I been teaching the 1798 infliction of the mortal wound and the United States being the second beast? How long have I preached that? 20 years, and it's wrong. 
It's wrong. I repent. God is still correcting me. And what kind of a Christian would I be if God could no longer correct me? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, I think the most important point is that you have to understand that you can be corrected and then to accept that you are being corrected and then take on that new information, that new wisdom given to you by studying the Word of God, uh, imputed to you by the Holy Spirit, and bring that out. Uh, nobody ever said 20 years ago that you are infallible or I am infallible or whoever. Uh, he, only the Pope calls himself infallible. That's why he is the Antichrist. And uh, we are exposing the Antichrist and we are learning every day. We are still learning today things, many things that we took for granted all of a sudden become a question mark. And even some things are so... Um, how can I say that, have such a hard impact um, that it really uh, shakes the foundation of our belief sometimes. And if then you understand something wrong, there is a big danger of not only false teaching, but most of all of false understanding in there. And that is because we rely so many times on so many people in this world instead of just studying it for, them, for ourselves. I can just name you one little example before we close our broadcast down here, which has come to an hour. I have lately looked into 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the so-called Comma Johanneum. And I studied it really, not for five minutes or so, but really for a longer time. And all of a sudden, I understood it the way the Bible wrote it, or God wrote it, and not the way that it is taught by mankind. And it gave me a completely different understanding, and I'm glad for that, because now, all of a sudden, many things that didn't make sense before make sense. And that's just one verse. And that happens with many verses, that happens with many chapters, and that happens with many books. But therefore, you need to study, quote-unquote, a lifetime, daily. And that is what separates us from the Bereans that were mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 17, because the Bereans were, I, I don't know the exact wording now, but they were better Jews than the ones in Thessalonica because they, they studied the Bible daily and saw and controlled if the things were so by holding everything against the Bible. And that's what we just don't do anymore because we are more or less educated in a way that we put our trust in other people and other writings. Let's not say only other preachers or teachers or whatever, but even other writings, uh, like commentaries to the Bible. And there sits the danger. Now, when you read a Bible like the wonderful Geneva Bible of 1560, which is in itself a wonderful Bible, but then when you get led astray and read the footnotes, and when you read commentaries of the Bible, and all of a sudden you venerate this man for writing that comment and that man for writing that comment over there, and all of a sudden you, after a short of time, the deeper you go into the studies, you don't know what to believe anymore because everybody's teaching something else. That commentator said that, that summit commentator said that. Now what are you going to believe? Pick and choose. Well. The only pick and choose that you should really make is in this picture here. It is the King James Bible. Let the Bible be the teacher. Let the Holy Spirit be your teacher when he leads you into all truth, when you study the Word of God. That is where we have to go back to. We have to go back to the basics. That's exactly what historicism is. Go back to the basics, go to the facts of history and measure those facts against the prophecy written hundreds of years before they ever happened. And when it matches, you see the fulfillment. But therefore, you need true historical records. And for the study of the Word of God, you need a true, historically correct Bible based on the correct texts 
and that's the 1611 King James Bible, at least for me and for Tom. That is the foundation of our faith. Yeah, Tom, if you have some closing remarks, I will gladly leave it up to you. Well, and since the Bible, the authorized King James Version 1611, is so much prophecy, then the only way we can get a perfect and correct understanding of Bible prophecy is to have an equally authoritative and correct record of history. And that's the hard part, because the papacy has made sure that history is written in a light that doesn't prove the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Okay? Prophecy is simply history foretold. If God prophesies something to happen, if it's a true prophecy, it will be fulfilled completely and perfectly and right on time so that there can be no question about that prophecy being fulfilled or not and by whom and at what time. To confirm all that, Bible prophecy, you have to have an accurate, correct document of history. Bible prophecy cannot be fulfilled, cannot be proven to be fulfilled unless the fulfillment is recorded in history. And that's where the papacy deceives us all. Rome tried as best she could to destro destroy the Bibles burn the Bibles, make sure only the priests of the Roman Catholic Church had a copy of the Bible, and everybody else had to believe whatever the, the priester taught him. Bible prophecy was the domain of the priests of the Roman Catholic Church exclusively. And they didn't have to manipulate history because nobody knew the, the true meaning of the prophecies. Now, however... The Bible has been faithfully translated into all the languages of the people so that they can read it for themselves. They can read the prophecies for themselves. And to confuse the people about what prophecies have been fulfilled, what prophecies are yet to be fulfilled, the papacy sees to it, the academics of this world see to it, that the accurate record of history has been molested so that we cannot see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Listen, if we have an accurate record of Bible prophecy, then no one can deceive us. If we have an accurate record of history, the fulfillment of those prophecies, no one can deceive us. And Rome falls flat on its foundation, not one stone left upon another. So you got to look long and hard for a correct record of history. <clears throat> and that's what we're about here at, at uh, the Hour of the Truth. That's what this is about. Showing you Bible prophecy and how it was fulfilled in history. And the most important example of that is Daniel's 70-week prophecy and its perfect, perfect and complete fulfillment as recorded in the New Testament. The New Testament is the historical record, the perfect historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. You can't read the 70th week of Daniel in his prophecy and the New Testament and not know that the purpose of the writing of the New Testament was to show you the minute fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That's the whole purpose of the New Testament, to prove that Daniel's 70th week is fulfilled by Jesus, Messiah the Prince. And now... With that understanding, no one can lie to you. But what does the whole Christian world believe? That the 70th week of Daniel is future. They don't make the connection between the written language of the New Testament and Daniel's 70th week prophecy. Now do you see how important an accurate record of history is? 
This is critical. If you can comprehend Daniel's prophecy and that the record, the historical record of its perfect and complete fulfillment is recorded in the New Testament, then you cannot believe in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And Rome falls flat on its foundation, not one stone remaining upon the other. The whole ecumenical movement falls to the ground. All your Protestant and evangelical pastors fall to the ground, and so do their churches. This is the judgment of Almighty God on the churches. Did not the Bible say judgment begins in the house of God? This is the judgment of the churches today. The discovery that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince, 2,000 years ago. And all of these lying pulpits across this country are going to be reckoned of God guilty of, of believing and teaching a lie. The futurist lie. And the judgment of Almighty God is coming down now as we speak. This is going to get serious as a heart attack. I'm not just being melodramatic. You see it with your own eyes. The churches are crumbling. There's going to be nothing left of them. The judgment of Almighty God is going to chastise the lying pulpits of our churches. They're all going to be found to be liars. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie For such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today